Hi, everyone. I'm Fraser Kane. I'm the publisher of Universe Today. I've been a space and astronomy journalist for over 20 years. This is our weekly news bites segment where I cover a lot of the big breaking news that we're covering over on Universe Today in short, bite sized segments. Now, I write a giant newsletter every week, send it out on Fridays to your email box, but we know we get it. Not everybody wants to read all of that news. Sometimes you just want to have the news videoed at you. So that's what this is. Let's get into the stories. We've got a date for the first James Webb pictures. Okay, okay. Now you can stop asking me when are we going to see the first pictures from James Webb? The date is July 12th, 2022. Put in your calendar, prepare yourself for the first scientific pictures coming out of James Webb. Now, NASA announced that they're going to be doing like a special event when these first pictures are done. And they said that unlike the calibration images, the focusing images that we've seen so far, these are going to be the full color, multi spectrum images, the kinds of things you've seen with Hubble and Spitzer and other space telescopes. We don't know what it's going to be a picture of yet. But folks at NASA have said it's going to be quite exciting and really showcase the capability of James Webb. So stay tuned. Of course, as soon as we get that first picture, I will let you know. And just in case you needed some more background information on James Webb, we just released a fairly long episode backgrounder on James Webb, how the telescope got built, what its capabilities are, where it's at right now and what to expect from coming next. And for those of you who nostalgically want to see more of my guide to space episodes, this is kind of in the theme. This is we're experimenting with how these episodes will work going into the future. So if you want more information on James Webb, you want to prepare yourself for the pictures, definitely check out this episode. NASA is getting new spacesuits. Last week, we talked about how NASA astronauts detected water coming into the spacesuits during a spacewalk. And based on this, NASA has stopped doing their spacewalks until they can get to the bottom of the problem, engineer some new solution. And this is a problem that's been around for a couple of years now. The spacesuits on the International Space Station are getting kind of old. In fact, NASA only has four of their spacesuits left. They've got a bunch on Earth for testing. It's time for new spacesuits. And this week, we got an announcement from NASA that they have chosen two new suppliers to give them spacesuits. One is a fairly well known name. It's Collins Aerospace. They're actually a subsidiary of Raytheon, and they have been providing spacesuits to NASA all the way back since the Apollo days. So they know how to make spacesuits. But the other company involved with this is Axiom Space. And that name might be familiar. These are the people that are doing new space tourism missions to the International Space Station. They had the first four person private space flight that went up to the space station. And we reported on it a couple of months back. They're also working on a module, a space tourism module that they're going to be attaching to the International Space Station. And now it looks like they've been contracted to help build the spacesuits. And what's different with the spacesuits this time around is NASA isn't looking to buy spacesuits, they're looking to rent them. And similar to how they're paying for private space flights with SpaceX and Boeing for their seats to the International Space Station. NASA is looking for outside agencies to provide them with spacesuits. And so you can see there's sort of this synergy because Axiom Space has got to be able to provide spacesuits to their paying customers. NASA needs spacesuits. It makes a lot of sense. Now, when I say renting, I don't mean that they're actually going to just be like borrowing the spacesuits and returning them. It means that in the past, NASA has gone and just developed their own spacesuits. And the spacesuits that they're looking to purchase this time around were developed with a lot of their intellectual property, but they've handed this over to the suppliers and they're going to be essentially owning the intellectual property and NASA is going to be paying them for spacesuits. They're going to be giving them a total of three and a half billion dollars through to 2034, which include a lot of the upcoming space station work as well as all of the Artemis missions to the moon. The Earth pretends to defend itself from an asteroid. So astronomers around the world have completed a mock exercise drill to detect a potential dangerous asteroid. 
And so what they did was back in 2020, when we knew the asteroid Apophis was going to be passing very close to the Earth, 100 different organizations across 18 different countries got together and they deleted asteroid Apophis from their asteroid databases. And so now they knew about all the other asteroids, except for asteroid Apophis. And Apophis is very special. It made a very close flyby in 2020. And it's expected to make another close flyby in 2029. And originally, when it was found, it was considered like the most dangerous, potentially hazardous asteroid that astronomers had ever found that there was a possibility that it was going to strike the Earth in 2029. And since there's been follow on observations, and now that risk has been ruled completely out, but it still is has all the hallmarks of an asteroid that's going to come very close, very dangerously close to the Earth. And so what they did then was they used all their standard asteroid automation systems to try to detect an asteroid. And the Catalina Sky Survey right on schedule, noticed this new asteroid passing through its field of view and said, Oh, this is a potentially dangerous asteroid. It charted all the information that it could provided this information out to other asteroid databases, other observers came online, their automated systems, double checked, looked at the movement of asteroid Apophis and decided that it was going to come very close to Earth, but it wasn't going to be dangerous. And this was a nice dry run to go through this entire process. What if one of these automated sky surveys finds an asteroid that is on a collision course with Earth? Can we get this information out very quickly? Can the governments be able to provide people potentially in the blast zone to be able to evacuate in time? So it's nice to see that the system works. Of course, we had don't look up, which is a movie fairly recently that covered this exact thing. And you can see how having many different observatories, many different people all working together to catch these asteroids and share the information dynamically around is very different from how it was shown in the movie. I'm not sure how people will deal with the result, though, like if we do find out that there is an asteroid on a collision course with Earth, will people take it seriously? Or will they wait or delay or whatever? So that part may still be accurate. I don't know. Voyager is sending home strange telemetry. The Voyager one spacecraft has been going for 45 years, it did a grand tour of the solar system, it saw Jupiter, and Saturn, its partner Voyager two also saw Jupiter and Saturn and then flew by Uranus and Neptune. More on that in, later on in this episode. But they have been going for 45 years, they're getting old. Voyager one is down to about four watts of power. That's like just enough to keep some of its science instruments going and be able to communicate back home with Earth. But getting old, who knows what kinds of problems it's having. And fairly recently, NASA found that Voyager one was sending back garbled telemetry information. And typically the telemetry information is a way that engineers here back on Earth can get a sense of where the spacecraft is how it's pointing what its velocity is. And this they are able to communicate this information back and forth with the spacecraft and what they were getting back from Voyager one just didn't make sense. But the spacecraft was still pointing its main dish back at Earth, it was still orienting itself correctly. So there's got to be some bug in the software somewhere. Maybe people will try to debug it or maybe they'll just go eh, you know, so it's, it's an old spacecraft. Don't listen to it anymore. But even so the spacecraft are running down. So you're going to hear more and more of these issues with Voyager one and two and eventually we'll get to a point where they do have to be shut down. And that'll be the last thing that we hear from them. So prepare yourself emotionally for saying goodbye to the Voyagers. A new kind of solar sail. Alright, this is really cool. Engineers have proposed a new type of solar sail and you're gonna look at the picture here. It's got this strange rainbow pattern across it as opposed to the traditional more silvered pattern that you've seen. And so this is called a diffraction light sail. And how it works is very different from a traditional solar sail, the light passes through this diffraction great pattern kind of like a Fresnel lens, and it allows the solar sail to be able to change its direction at very steep angles 
depending on where the illumination is coming from. And this technology was recently awarded a phase three NIAC grant. Of course, we talk about the NIAC grants all the time here on my channel. This is a special NASA Advanced Innovative Concepts Awards where they hand out funding for various engineers and scientists to investigate really out there ideas in space flight, space travel, propulsion systems, telescopes, things like that. So this diffractive light sail could work really well to be able to observe the sun. It could tack in directions that would give it a really unique perspective to the sun, being able to maybe see the sun's poles as opposed to just being able to see the equator. So the technology has moved to the next phase of investment and funding from NASA. And who knows, maybe in a few years, we might actually see this fly. Now, of course, similar NIAC grant is the solar gravitational lens. And I did an interview with Dr. Slava Turashev just a few weeks ago about that incredible technology. And so if you want to hear about like really out there concepts in space exploration, definitely check that out. If you're enjoying all of the space news here on our channel and all of our platforms, why don't you consider joining our Patreon? This is a way for you to be able to support the work we do to pay for all of the video editing, the writing, the audio production, um, articles, stories, everything. If you join our Patreon, you get behind the scenes information, interviews with me, we'll remove all the ads from our videos and you get all the ads removed from Universe Today for life. Even if you stop becoming a patron, you'll never see any ads on Universe Today. And so just go to patreon.com slash universe today. And you might be interested, we've been doing some behind the scenes interviews with people on the team. So you can see who's doing the work. And so I just completed two interviews with the Nancy's Nancy Graziano and Nancy Atkinson. Nancy Graziano is of course, the producer for the weekly space hangout and a lot of the live events that we do. Nancy Atkinson is our senior editor has been the longest working writer for universe today, really, uh, sets a lot of the tone for the website. Both of those interviews are available on the Patreon page. They're both publicly available, but you do have to go to the channel to be able to listen to them. Interstellar travel without the spaceship. When people think about the idea of interstellar travel, they think about some kind of exotic spaceflight technology like a warp drive or a wormhole or a jump drive or something. And of course, all of these break the laws of physics as we understand them. If we want to maintain the laws of physics as we understand them today, we're going to need to go below the speed of light. And that means it's going to take us tens, hundreds, thousands of years to travel from star system to star system. And so if you're going to do that, how do you stay alive? And like one idea is a generation starship where people live, die, generation after generation on a spaceship until finally one final generation reaches the destination planet and settles it. But a new paper proposes that you could use rogue planets as spaceships to fly across the Milky Way. And we've talked about rogue planets in the past. These are often formed early on in a in the formation of a solar system and they're kicked out of the star system and they roam the Milky Way. And there could be billions, tens of billions, maybe as many rogue planets as there are regular planets across the Milky Way. And you'd think, oh, like a planet without a star, it's going to be too cold. It's not possible. But when you think about ocean worlds like Europa and Enceladus, even though the outer shell of this planet could be frozen solid, it could still have a liquid ocean underneath and you could have radiative heating coming from inside the planet, you got just the warmth left over from its formation. And that could keep you alive for millions, even billions of years. And so the idea is that a advanced civilization could take their planet as their star is dying, be able to ride this, this planet out from star system to star system. And you could do most of the journey just drifting. And then as you get closer, then you could try to actually build your starships and actually move over to this new star system. And there's actually a lot of objects here in the solar system that would be almost perfect for this, like Sedna, you know, objects that are on a very long orbit that don't actually require a lot of change in velocity to be able to 
to go on to an escape trajectory out of the solar system. And like, obviously, almost every part of this is science fiction. And if you want, there is a science fiction movie, I think you can get it on Netflix called Wandering Earth by the science fiction author Xi Jin Liu, same guy that did the three body problem series, and talk about this idea. So uh, yeah, it's science fiction. But still, there's some interesting bits of science throughout it that I think you'll find really, really fun. Juice mission is almost ready to go. The European Space Agency is almost ready to launch its JUICE mission, the Jupiter Icy Moons Explorer. And this is a spacecraft that's going to be launching in mid-2023. It's going to be flying to the Jovian system. It's going to take eight years to get to Jupiter. And once it does, it's going to do various orbits around Callisto and Europa and Ganymede. And eventually, it's actually going to go into orbit around Ganymede and study this world in great detail. And Ganymede is really interesting. You know, I'm calling it the new Europa. It is the largest moon in the solar system. It has a it's believed to have a subsurface ocean just like Europa does. But it also has an internal dynamo and a global magnetosphere. It's one of the few bodies in the solar system that has this magnetosphere. Very interesting place, very worth visiting. And so the juice mission just finished the integration phase where they brought all of the pieces, all of the instruments, the spacecraft and assembled it all into one place. Now they're going to go through the testing phase that's going to take about a year. But if all goes well, we should see juice launch in April 2023, which is just around the corner. Like it's kind of amazing that we're now less than a year away from a new mission flying off to the moons of Jupiter. We finally know why Neptune and Uranus are different colors. I talked about Voyager early on and Voyager 2 was the spacecraft that did the true grand tour of the solar system. It went past Jupiter and Saturn and then flew off to Uranus and Neptune. And the only high resolution images that we've got of Jupiter and Neptune come from this flyby from Voyager 2 back in 1986 and then 1989. And when you look at the pictures, and this has been confirmed with the Hubble Space Telescope and other ground based observatories, the colors of the two planets are, although they're both blue ish, they're different. While Neptune is this sort of more bright blue, Uranus is a more duller blue. So why the difference? Why do we have this change in color? This has been a puzzle that astronomers have trying to work out. Now, they're very similar worlds both in what their internal composition is, but especially for their atmospheres, their atmospheres are largely hydrogen and helium and methane. And it's the methane that seems to be the key. At around 91 Kelvin, methane turns into snow. And so in both Uranus and Neptune, you've got the temperatures ranging where methane is starting to turn into snow in the upper atmosphere. And then the snow is falling down inside the atmosphere. Now on Neptune, you got much higher winds, but it's a lot colder. And so this this material is snowing down and disappearing out of the atmosphere of the upper atmosphere. While on Uranus, because it's a little warmer, this material can sort of stay around get kind of kicked back up into the atmosphere, and it acts like this haze. And so what you're seeing when you look at this picture of Uranus is you're seeing the haze from the methane that is being suspended in the upper atmosphere. So we've got a few more quick stories to talk about. One is that we just heard that there's another two week delay from the FAA for Boca Chica for the Starship launch. So now we're probably looking at mid June, but who knows, maybe it's gonna be late June, mid July, it launches when it launches. But and you know, we've we've heard that Starship has had its all of its Raptor two engines installed. So they're getting closer to launch the FEA is getting closer to giving them permission to launch. And so hopefully, in the next few weeks, next month, next couple of months, we should see Starship take off for the first time. The Tau Herculid meteor storm was a dud. Now, a couple of weeks ago, I told you with great excitement that there could be an exciting meteor storm. But I also said that it might not happen. And it didn't happen. We actually got some interesting fireball activity. A lot of people were reporting seeing very bright fireballs in the sky. But this thousands of meteors, tens of thousands of meteors an hour just didn't happen even for people in really dark skies. So like, do we not trust astronomers anymore? Of course we do. We always know that these kinds of events are 
unpredictable. Astronomers do the best they can to give you some sort of advance notice that this kind of event is going to happen. And I can remember many times when a potential meteor storm didn't materialize. But I can also remember times when they did and they blew my mind. Same thing with auroras. When the sun, you know, blasts off this giant flare, and we can expect aurora activity here on Earth in the next couple of days. Sometimes it doesn't show up. Sometimes it's less than you're expecting. And sometimes it's incredible. So you have to be okay, you have to be ready to live with this kind of uncertainty and be willing to go out and stand outside and look up and hope and see what you can see. And sometimes you're rewarded. And most of the time you're not but it's those few times when you are that make it all worth it. We've done a few more interviews here on our YouTube channel, the one that you should definitely check out I did just a couple of days ago was with Dr. Leah Jenks. She is a cosmologist, a physicist. And she spent an hour talking with me about the future of general relativity and dark matter and where do we go from here trying to figure out ways to unify quantum mechanics and gravity. I think you'll really enjoy it. And for people who are wondering about our book club, uh, we are working on the details behind the scenes. I think we're going to be doing this on Goodreads right now. So if you have a Goodreads account, definitely uh, be prepared. If you don't have one, get that set up. And we'll probably provide a list that you can add of books that we're going to be reading together. And I will be reporting on them every week. So stay tuned. We'll probably have an announcement in the next couple of weeks. All right, those are all the news stories that we had this week. Thank you, everyone for watching this week. Now, this is again, just a subset of the giant email newsletter that I send out every Friday. So if you want to get many, many, many more stories, all written by me in a magazine of space news, totally ad free, you should definitely subscribe to our weekly email newsletter, just go to universe today.com slash newsletter to sign up. And if you want to listen to all of the stuff that we do all the videos, all of the interviews, you should sign up to our podcast, you can just go to universe today.com slash podcast or search for universe today on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. So in addition to all of the audio for the videos that I put onto the podcast, I actually include a lot of behind the scenes and additional stuff like interviews with me. And so uh, this week, I was interviewed on the street epistemology podcast, they had me defend my belief that humanity is the only intelligent civilization in the observable universe for about 90 minutes. So if you want to hear that, definitely subscribe to the podcast I got the full audio of me desperately trying to convince people that we're all alone. So definitely check that out. Thank you to everyone who already supports us on Patreon. Thanks to all the interplanetary researchers, the interstellar adventurers, the galaxy wanderers, your support means the universe to us. All right, that was all the news that we had this week. We'll see you next week.